morning, everybody. Uh, thank you again for uh, having us today to discuss the DPP, what it is, what will uh, become maybe in future. Um, basically, the objective of my speech is to, to plant some of the seeds that we will then be discussing in detail during the day. So I want to present you the the reason why uh, we have DPP, how it will evolve from a commission perspective in terms of policy context, and then also give you some of the details about the work that is ongoing and the work, work that is planned in the, in the two, three years to come before the DPP really uh, becomes implementable uh, in 2027. So the DPP, the Digital Product Passport, was introduced as part of the new uh, legislation on eco-design which is called Eco-Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, or in short, ESPR. You know how much in Commission we love acronyms, so you will hear this acronym very often, and many more. Uh, but this is not a new piece of legislation, the ESPR. It's building on uh, probably one of the most successful legislation that we adopted in 2005, the Eco-Design Directive, that really contributed a lot to reduce energy consumption in Europe and uh, saving uh, uh, climate-related emissions. Uh, we are saving the uh, comparable amount of emissions released by Poland. Uh, so it's, it's quite a, an interesting amount. And the, as the eco-design, also the ESPR is a framework legislation, meaning that you won't find in their detailed requirements, uh, maybe with one exception this time when it comes to uh, destruction of unsold consumer products, but that is not DPP-related, so I will not uh, elaborate further on that. But in general, it's framework legislation. That means that then it requires secondary legislation, delegated act, uh, in order to define uh, rules that are applicable at product group level. And this is what we have been doing with the design what we will continue to be doing with, the, with the ESPR. And then uh, the decision of which product groups will be regulated is something that is uh, taken by the Commission with, in consultation with stakeholders, and that ends up in a uh, multi-annual working plan that uh, we, we, it will have a, an average duration of three years. So every three years, we will revise the working plan. The first working plan um, will be adopted within nine months from the entry into force of the legislation, which has not yet entered into force because there is the final step, the final plenary vote in the Parliament that is um, scheduled for uh, late ap April this year. So after that, the legislation will be published in the official journal, we think around summer, early summer, and then is when the, the clock starts kicking in terms of entry into force. Okay. Um, this, the new ESPR, while is building on the existing one, it's also very different from the existing one under uh, many dimensions. So there are many angles that we, we, we may like to explore. I, for reason of time, I will not explore with you today, but I just mentioned them. The new ESPR is wider in scope in the sense that uh, while the old one was only covering energy using and energy related products, in principle, the new ESPR is covering everything but food, feed, a uh, few pharmaceutical uh, products. Everything else in theory is in scope. As I mentioned, then it will depend what goes in the um, working plan in terms of what really will be regulated. The second uh, change is the emphasis on uh, other elements of environmental sustainability and circularity than what we had before. Before we were focusing on climate change as an impact and on circularity in terms of uh, water, availability of spare parts, and some other consideration related to the lifetime of the products. With the new ESPR, we are going with a full package. So we are looking at all sustainability-related aspects. We are looking at uh, a wider range of uh, circularity-related aspects. And, uh, and we are also focusing more uh, on the um, uh, competitiveness component of it in terms of level playing field. So this is the second uh, change. And the third change, which is probably one of the most encompassing and we also one of the, that will be more difficult to implement from a, a legislative perspective, is the fact that while in the existing eco-design we were focusing mostly on the use stage, so on what happens when you are using the product, and that was also reflected in terms of requirements, with the ESPR we are going full life cycle. So we are really looking at the entire supply chain, I would say, and the entire value chain is also considered what happens after the product is placed on the market. And that, of course, will bring uh, its own uh, complexity from an implementation viewpoint. 
So basically, uh, in these slides, you can see on the right some of the aspects that might be re um, regulated for the different product groups. That does not mean that everything will be regulated. This is just a, a, a list of things that may be regulated. And in terms of how this will be articulated in the requirement, in the Delegated Act, we will have performance requirements and information requirements. Please be, keep in mind that they are both mandatory. We are not anymore in the realm of uh, voluntary legislation. This is mandatory. All these requirements, if not fulfilled, means that that product cannot be placed in the European market. The other things to keep in mind is that ESPR is, uh, I mean, the legal basis is Article 114 of the treaty, which means internal market regulation. What does that mean? That the requirements apply in the exact same way to products produced in Europe and products imported from outside Europe. The performance requirements are usually technical requirements that comes with uh, a number, with a threshold, while the information requirements do not come with the threshold, but there the requirements is that it is mandatory to provide certain information. Uh, to give an example, you can have uh, a requirements on, uh, on uh, carbon footprint, for example. You could have it both as an information requirement only, as, for example, we have with batteries regulation, or you may have it with a threshold, like we will have for photovoltaic panels and system, where basically they are threshold that if you are higher than the threshold, you cannot place the product on the market from a carbon footprint perspective. The digital product passport that we are discussing today is not, I mean, it, it's basically, it's a vehicle of information. So all the information requirements that will be identified will be included in the digital product passport. And then the digital product passport will also include other uh, data, other information as relevant for the product group as we will be uh, discussing today. So, more in general, the political context, I really don't want to, to invest too much time. The only thing that I, I want to underline here, I mean, there are two things. One is that while the, um, the digital product passport has been introduced through the ESPR regulation, it, this is part of a wider um, 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 objective of the Commission. It should be seen in a wider picture. So, it's, there are other legislations that already today have embedded the concept of the DPP in their legal text. I mentioned batteries, but we also have the new toys regulation, the new detergents regulation, the new construction product regulation, and then there are elements of DPP uh, included in some other legislation, like, for example, in the Critical Raw Material Act. So the idea from the Commission perspective is that with time, DPP will become the main uh, tool in order to have access to information in a digital way in, when related to products. And the other thing that I want to mention uh, is that we are really desperately trying not to reinvent the wheel. And we are doing that in doing our, our policy text. We are doing that in uh, working with uh, the standardization bodies, as we will uh, uh, mention later. There is an ongoing work uh, in, uh, in order to develop harmonized standards for DPP. And what the, the constant message that we are sending is there are already today more than 100 DPP systems in Europe only that are either working or in the making. There are international standards already for most of the things that the DPP shall deliver. Please do not come with something new, but come with something that works from an interoperability perspective. Interoperability for us is one of the non-negotiable uh, red lines when it comes to DPP, and that is why we are insisting that the DPP should be designed starting from what already exists and improving what already exists. State of play. Uh, I already mentioned that there is uh, the Parliament voting in April, then publication in summer, so we can skip this one. In terms of the first working plan, uh, there is a list of product groups already included in, le in the legislative text. This was added by the Council and the Parliament. It was not in the original proposal from the Commission. Of course, we will look into this list. This will be the starting point. We still have uh, some margin for maneuvers as a commission to remove or add product groups, but we will have, of course, to justify why we are doing that. Um, there, is a, there has been already a preparatory study done by GSC, Joint Research Center. Uh, probably you have been also been involved already in the open consultation on that. There are two product groups on which the commission has already started working, uh, which is uh, textile and iron and steel as an intermediate product because this is a, a novelty compared to the past. In the past, we were only regulating final products. With the ESPR, now we are also have given the possibility to regulate intermediate products, like steel, aluminum, and others. And so we are starting with, with steel. Now, some main features from, uh, for the DPP. 
the, the real big novelty is that it is a decentralized system. Everything else we have done in the past was centralized. Now, with the DPP, and it's not the only one, because, for example, the Commission is now also developing the EFTI, the Electronic Freight Transport Information System, which also will be decentralized. So this is just to, it's an indicator that probably the, 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 the trends in future will be more and more to work in decentralized system rather than centralized one, which, as you know, because you are all experts, opens a huge list of uh, challenges uh, to be solved but uh, we think it's, it's the right direction. The DPP will be uh, linked to a product. So we are using the DPP uh, to, to, to in relation to spe specific to products or components, not to, to create a DPP for documents. Um, so basically the access will happen through a unique identifiers embedded in a data carrier and relying on a lookup mechanism to be developed. The information in the DPP will be both public and restricted. Uh, and that is why, in order to have access to the restricted part of the information, we will rely on an on a access rights-based uh, management system, so on an need-to-know basis. There will be three possible levels of granularity, uh, model, batch, and item, and the level of granularity will be specific to the product groups. So for each product group, the Commission, among many other decisions, will also decide which is the, the level of granularity that is most relevant for that product group. We expect that one of the decisive factor in taking this decision will be how relevant is that product group from a circularity perspective. Because if repairing activities, refurbishment is very relevant, then it is probably necessary to go to the item level. If it is not that relevant, probably it is not necessary to go to the item level. In terms of requirement for companies, uh, they will have, I mean, the companies here is meant, uh, in, I mean, legal terms is the economic operator placing the product on the market, which means either the manufacturer or the importer. From an NLF perspective, this is what uh, it's defined as an economic operator placing the product on the market. So they will have to make sure that the product passport exists, that the product passport is complete with all the data required by the legislation as mandatory data and also that the, that data is authentic, reliable, and verified. Other requirements for companies, these have been added uh, during the trilogue, so in negotiation. Um, a backup copy of the DPP will have to be stored by an independent uh, third-party product passport service provider. Uh, we will see, and I will explain later, if it is going to be certified or not. This is uh, still up to discussion. And then another requirement for companies that they have to make available the unique product identifier or the data carrier uh, for online shopping and to the dealers. Now, in terms of uh, a bit of uh, jargon, when we talk about the DPP system, we talk about all the standards and protocols that are related to the IT architecture, basically what is going to be uh, standardized um, through, the, through harmonized standards to be developed and also the DPP uh, registry. So this is basically the DPP system. When we talk about the DPP data, that is the content of the passport. So technical performance, environmental sustainability, circularity, legal compliance, and other product-related information. The DPP system will be standardized through standardization work. The DPP data will not go through a standardization request because the content of the passport will be identified through the normal legislative process. So when doing the preparatory study and the impact assessment at product group specific level, like we are doing for textile and steel, that is where we will propose requirements, discuss requirements with stakeholders, including member states and uh, I mean, all relevant stakeholders, and then that the decision will be included in the delegated act. A uh, few words very fast on the central registry, which is the only element of centralization in the whole architecture. Um, the central registry, as you can see on the left, will include the three identifiers, so the product identifier, the economic operator identifier, the facility identifier. These will be public identifiers. Then there will be another, a fourth identifier that will not be public. This is just needed uh, to, as a part of the mechanism to prove the authenticity of the DPP, the registration identifier. There must probably there will be a commodity code and then the reference to the backup system. I mean, this is not yet set in stone. It's still a matter of discussion and negotiation, but this is most probably what will be included in the registry. And the registry will be used mostly for two things. One is we will link the registry to the uh, IT system used by custom authorities, the CERTEX uh, system, and that will allow 
a big change, I think, because now in terms of uh, checks, the checks are based on uh, on a risk-based uh, approach at cu by customs. By linking the the the, C the registry to the CERTEX, we will be able to go to a 100% automatic checks by custom authorities in terms of existence of the DPP um, and its authenticity. Then the second reason why we will use the, the registry is be, uh, to connect it to another thing that has been introduced by the negotiators during the trilogues by the Council and the Parliament, which is the, the web portal. So basically, whoever will want to uh, make research and compare information, including the DPP, without having the physical object in their end, so without needing to scan, they will be able to do this through a web portal that the Commission will design and maintain. And uh, there will be a web portal for the public data, and then there will be a part for the restricted data. And uh, so the, the access, I mean, the web portal will link to the registry, and then that will be the entry point to then starting the, the research work. In terms of uh, uh, further legislation to, that is needed in order to have the DPP implementable, we have the empowerment to basically adopt three acts. One will be um, a delegated act on the rules and requirements, procedures to be followed by the DPP service providers, because they will play a very pivotal role in the whole system. So it's important that they are regulated. And in that context, we will uh, assess the opportunity or not of having them also certified. Uh, that was in the original proposal of the Commission. Uh, but then um, during the negotiation, uh, the co-legislators um, asked us to first run a dedicated impact assessment to analyze the implication in terms of pros and cons, costs and benefits of having them mandatorily certified. So after we will run this impact assessment based on the outcomes of these studies, we will decide if there's going to be a, a certification scheme or not for DPP service providers. The second act will be an implementing act where we'll basically we will set the rules and procedure to manage digital credentials that we think will play an important role in, in uh, DPPs. Uh, and then the third one will be about uh, issuing agency or not issuing agency. Uh, because we, as you see, I mean, as, if you have read the, the CIRPAS deliverables, I'm sure you have, you have. There are basically two systems uh, possible. One that is relying on issuing agency, which is, I would say, the, the prevailing system today. And then there is also the possibility of not relying on issuing agencies or self-minting identifiers that are carriers. But of course, we need, from the legislative perspective, we are agnostic to which system is used, but they have to provide the same uh, guarantees in terms of you know, reliability of information and et cetera. So we need to, to set up rules that exactly ensure that this is uh, on a level playing field, let's say. And then we will keep working on the design of the DPP registry and the web portal. This is in-house work, so we plan to, to do it through our digit digit uh, colleagues. Um, then, uh, in terms of some timelines, um, the harmonized standards uh, should be available hopefully by the end of 2025, which is also the date by when we hope to have all the DPP governance of these three acts that I was uh, mentioning adopted. In 26, the plan is to really be there to help companies, SMEs in particular, member states and DPP service providers to implement all the rules, the standards and the rules. So basically, through the Commission services, we will plan to have uh, a number of activities to, to help this happening. So 2026 will be the, the testing uh, part of the, of the work. Then batteries will kick in, in February 2027. They will be the first one to really have an, an implementable uh, DPP. In terms of ESPR, uh, probably the first DPPs will appear towards the end of 2027. And I think in 2027, we will also start seeing DPPs for uh, detergents and, uh, and toys, I think. So DPP, I mean, 2027 is really going to be the DPP years from my perspective. And with that, uh, sorry if I was too long, but thank you very much for your attention.